Okay, so today we're going to finish up our review on SN1 and SN2 mechanisms of alkyl halides. So yesterday, or excuse me, on Monday in class, we uh, built our table that um, highlighted the importance of the substrate, the uh, degree of substitution on the substrate, as well as the strength of the nucleophile, what solvents we were supposed to use, um, looked at the mechanisms, and we uh, talked a bit about the stereochemistry and the, the last column in our table there about rearrangements. That's kind of what we're going to elaborate on today, the stereochemistry and the rearrangements. So um, remember the difference between an SN1 and an SN2 mechanism is that an SN2 mechanism occurs all at the same time. I know it, it seems backwards. An SN2 has one step and an SN1 has two steps. So if we look here at the slide, this is um, explaining the mechanism of an SN2 mechanism where there's only one step. And so what we can see is that the uh, nucleophile, in this, case, in this case the OH-, the hydroxide nucleophile, is approaching our alkyl halide from the backside. We call this a backside attack. An SN2 mechanism always has to have a backside attack. It has to come from the opposite side because the leaving group is so large and also negatively charged that it repels the nucleophile. So the nucleophile can't fit on the same side as the leaving group. The nucleophile has to come from the opposite side, from the backside. So SN2s always have backside attack. So notice how the hydroxide ion here comes from the back and it's attacking that blue orbital. So the blue orbital is a representation of the anti-bonding orbital um, that is part of the sigma bond, the CBr sigma bond. So we, we briefly discussed this in uh, the first term and we'll look at it a little bit more uh, later on in this term. Um, about bonding orbitals and anti-bonding orbitals. But remember, this just has to do with molecular orbital theory. When, um, whenever we have a pair of electrons in a bonding orbital that's stabilizing, and when we have a pair of electrons in an anti-bonding orbital that's destabilizing. So the green lobe represents the bonding orbital, the bond between carbon and bromine. <clears throat> so that's a stabilizing, the, that molecular orbital is bonding, it's full of two electrons, and so that's a stable bond. When the hydroxide ion, see the hydroxide ion has those three lone pairs, and one of the lone pairs of electrons on that hydroxide is being donated into the blue lobe of that orbital, and that blue lobe is the anti-bonding orbital. So what's happening in this mechanism is that the antibonding orbital is directly 180 degrees away from the bonding orbital. That's on the backside. That's what we. That's why we call this a backside attack because it's 180 degrees away. And when the hydroxide donates a pair of electrons, notice in the first image on the left there are three pairs of electrons on that hydroxide, and in the transition state there's only two pairs of electrons on the oxygen. That's because one pair has been donated to that anti-bonding orbital. And when we fill an anti-bonding orbital, that weakens the, the bond, the initial bond, uh, that was a, a pair of bonding and anti-bonding orbitals with that carbon-bromine bond being the bonding pair. So the, the transition state, notice how the transition state, we have both of these groups attached now. The leaving group is still attached on the right, and now the new the nucleophile, the new bond, is being formed on the left, and in the transition state we have both bonds being present. And so this is a very unstable species here. It Notice how it breaks the octet rule. Carbon has five bonds in this structure, so therefore it has ten electrons. It's breaking the octet rule. Um, so remember when we think about transition states, we say that they are um, unstable structures that only exist for an instant. In fact, they're, they're theoretical in the sense that we can't, they exist for such a short amount of time that we can't even find any spectroscopic evidence that they, that they exist because they, they are formed and then they uh, break apart in such a short amount of time that we can't take a picture of them fast enough. So this is kind of a theoretical uh, um, 
midpoint between the two states that we can see. We can definitely see the reactants on the left side if we, we could take a picture of them spectroscopically. We can take a picture of the products on the right side spectroscopically, and the transition state is kind of halfway in between those two states, so we kind of assume that it exists and it looks similar to this. So um, notice how because the two steps in a SN2 reaction occur at the same time, if we look at that bottom figure there, both of those arrows, the curly arrows representing the movement of electrons, they both happen at the same time. The nucleophile attacks at the same time simultaneously as the leaving group leaving. And so we form this transition state. And again, because the, the bromine is blocking the right side of the molecule, the nucleophile must come from the left side. So the, the stereochemical outcome of this relationship is that whichever side the leaving group is on initially, whether it's on the left or the right, in this case it's on the right side, the new bond that I'm being formed, that's being formed between that carbon and the nucleophile is always on the opposite side, in this case the left side. So in that first image on the top, on the left, bromine is on the right, and in the product side, on the far right of that image, our new bond is on the left of the carbon. So we, this is the nature of the backside attack, and this also uh, has the consequence of inverting the stereochemistry. So in this particular example, because the carbon that's attached to the bromine is not uh, asymmetric, it's not a stereocenter, because it has three of the same atom attached to it, H, H, and H, and remember, in order to be a stereocenter, an asymmetric carbon, it has to have four different groups. All four of those groups have to be different in order for this to be a chiral compound. So in this case, it's not a chiral compound to begin with when the Br is attached, and it's still not a chiral com compound at the end when the OH is attached because it still has those three Hs on there. So it's not asymmetric in either case. So it, it seems a bit strange to say that we're inverting the stereochemistry on this molecule when it's not chiral in the first place. It's, it's neither R nor S in the reactant, and it's neither R nor S in the product. It's not chiral. However, that's not always the case. Sometimes we have SN2 substrates that are chiral, where the, the carbon that's being attacked is a stereocenter, and therefore, if I'm switching the side of the highest priority group, which is generally the leaving group in the reactant side and generally the nucleophile in the product side, when they, when they change sides like this due to the backside attack, an R stereocenter turns into an S and an S stereocenter turns into an R. So we invert the stereochemistry. We only get inversion in, S in an SN2 mechanism as we see here because we always have this relationship that the new bond being formed is on the opposite side of the molecule as the old bond that's being broken. So we can see that those stereochemical implications here um, where we actually do have a stereo, uh, a, a chiral compound. So we, we, this compound does have stereoisomers. So if we look at the bottom example here, now two of those H's have been replaced by other groups. We have a methyl group, an ethyl group, a hydrogen, and a bromine all attached to that carbon. So therefore that carbon is an asymmetric carbon and it is a stereocenter. And this particular stereoisomer is the S stereoisomer. So before the reaction occurs, the, the reactant on the left side um, is the S isomer, or it has the bromine, the leaving group is on the right side of the molecule as indicated. And then um, the nucleophile does a backside attack and then we see this transition state where the leaving group and the nucleophile are exactly 180 degrees separated from each other. Um, and then in the product side, when the leaving group has left and now the nucleophile is attached, that bond has switched sides. The green CBr bond on, was on the right in the reactant and the blue COH bond is on the left in the product. And so what that does is it switches the stereocenter. It was S in the reactant now it's R in the product. If it was R in the reactant, the backside attack would cause it to become an S in the product. So we always switch the stereocenter. That's what inversion means. 
SN2 always inverts the stereo center. Here is another example where uh, this is a cis isomer in this cyclo, uh, this cyclopentane here. Um, we've got a methyl group that's pointing down and the bromine is also pointing down. They're both on the same side of that ring. So we would call that a cis isomer. And um, the hydroxide is going to approach from the back side and we form this transition state where the nucleophile and the leaving group are exactly separated by 180 degrees and in the product the leaving group has left and the nucleophile is attached and now the nucleophile is on top. So the old bond was on the bottom and the new bond is on the top of that cyclopentane ring. So we have switched from a cis isomer where both groups were on the bottom of the ring to a trans isomer where one group is on the bottom and one group is on the top. So again, we have inverted the stereochemistry. We've switched the stereochemistry at that one atom, not at both atoms, because the carbon, um, the methyl group is still on the bottom. We didn't do anything to the methyl group that's on the bottom. So we only switched the stereochemistry of the alkyl halide, the, the side that was reacting with the leaving group. Okay, so let's look at the stereochemical implications of an SN1 mechanism, which is a bit different. Because remember, in an SN2 mechanism, there's only one step, but in an SN1 mechanism, there's two steps. The first step in an SN1 is that the leaving group leaves all by itself. And that's what we see here in that first image on the left. We see the bromine on top of this molecule, that purple curly arrow is indicating that the bond is breaking and the leaving group is leaving and it's taking its electrons with it. So notice in the next image, uh, bromine has four lone pairs. In the first image, bromine only has three lone pairs and it's neutral. And in the next image, bromine has four lone pairs and it has a negative charge. That's because it has left the molecule and it has taken that pair of electrons with it. So the bond between C and Br became a new lone pair on the bromide ion. And so what that does is since we're taking electrons away from that carbon in the CBr bond, the carbon has become positive. It's turned into a carbocation. So a couple things to notice here. When carbon has four bonds, it's tetrahedral because those electrons in those bonds try to spread out as far as possible and that gives us 109.5 degree bond angles approximately. So this is a tetrahedral geometry in our reactant. And it also has the stereochemistry that it's an S. So notice that it's also an asymmetric carbon. It has a methyl group, it has an ethyl group, it has an isopropyl group, and it has a bromine. All four of those groups attached to the carbon are different groups. Therefore, this is a stereocenter. It's an asymmetric carbon. And this particular stereoisomer is the S. So after the bromine leaves, the, those three groups that are still bonded to the carbocation, we still have a methyl, ethyl, and an isopropyl. They did not leave the carbocation. When I have four groups, the furthest apart those bonds can get is 109.5 degrees. So they try to spread out as far as possible, and that gives us a tetrahedral geometry. But after the bromine leaves, we only have three groups attached to the carbon. So now those three groups can spread out a little bit further. And so notice how the geometry of the carbocation has changed. It's now the, the angle between those three remaining groups is 120 degrees. It's become trigonal planar in its geometry. And that's just a consequence of those electrons in those bonds repelling each other. And they spread out as far as possible, which is approximately 120 degrees between the bonds. So what this does is it also makes the carbocation flat or planar. Notice how um, in the reactant, those three carbon-containing groups are kind of pointing down relative to the plane, uh, perpendicular to the page. And now those three carbon-containing groups on the carbocation are in the plane perpendicular to the page or to the screen that we're looking at. So that means that it's kind of a, a flat geometry. We call that a planar geometry which means that that empty p orbital, which is represented as a green lobe on top and a blue lobe on bottom, both are two parts of one orbital that we call a p orbital, 
Now, because that carbocation is flat, the top space is just as approachable as the bottom space. They're equally open because there is no, uh, there's no preferred site of attack. Remember that the reason that in an SN2, the nucleophile has to come from the backside is because in an SN2, the geometry is tetrahedral and that leaving group hasn't left yet and it's blocking one side. In this case, if we look at this example, it would be blocking the top side. That green lobe, if this were an SN2 mechanism, would be unapproachable because it still has a bromine attached to it. But in an SN1 mechanism, the bromine has already left, and so now both lobes are equally approachable. The, the nucleophile can approach from the top to the green lobe, or the nucleophile can approach to the bottom from the, at the blue lobe. So this changes the stereochemical consequence of an SN1 mechanism. So notice how in this example, the bromine is on the top, and when it leaves, it uh, leaves that green P orbital open, unoccupied. So if the nucleophile attacks that green orbital that's, that the bromine has left, that's now approachable because the bromine's not in the way anymore, if the nucleophile attaches there, then notice that in that green on the top, um, that our nucleophile is an ethanol in this case. It has two carbons and an OH group. So notice how in our product there, the green product on the far right, um, the, new, the new bond between C and O is on the top in exactly the same place as the old bond between C and Br. They're both on the top in this case. Remember that didn't happen in the SN2 if the leaving group was on the top in an SN2, the new bond has to be on the bottom. But in an SN1, that's not true. The, the old bond can be on the top, and the new bond can be on the top. We call that retention of configuration. The stereochemistry has been retained. It was not inverted in this case, it was retained. Notice how the stereochemistry of the reactant is an S, and the stereochemistry of the green product is an S. That's because the leaving group and the new bond between C and O, they're both on the same side of the molecule. So that does not change the stereochemistry of that compound. If the nucleophile attacks from the bottom, because remember, both sides are equally approachable, and so the, some, the nucleophile attacks some of these carbocations on the top, and the nucleophile attacks some of these carbocations on the bottom. If it attacks the bottom, notice how my new bond, the bond between C and O, is now on the bottom of the molecule. So the old bond between C and Br was on the top of the molecule, and the new bond between C and O in that blue product is on the bottom of the molecule. So that looks just like the SN2. The old bond was on top, the new bond is on the bottom. So that's the same. We call that inversion of configuration. The reactant was an S, the blue product is an R the stereo center has switched. It's changed its configuration from S to R. So in SN2, we only get inversion because both steps happen at the same time and the nucleophile cannot approach the same side as the leaving group because it's blocked by the leaving group. But in an SN1, the nucleophile can attack both sides, can approach both sides because the leaving group has already left, it's gone. So in an SN2, we only get inversion and in SN1, we get inversion and retention. It can attack both sides. Here is another example that's similar to the cyclopentane example we saw for an SN2. So in, it, let's just think back to our SN2 example. The bromine was on the top, therefore the new bond must be on the bottom in an SN2. And we can see that, that the bottom product here has the new bond on the bottom. But we also have the um, possibility that our nucleophile is going to attack the same side of the molecule that the leaving group was on. So in this case, the bromine was on the top side of that ring. And in our first series of reactions, I guess we would call it in the middle here. Sorry, it's hard to point that out when I'm not when I don't have a pointer. But the middle reaction here shows that the bromine was on the top, the bromine left. We made a, a planar carbocation that has two empty lobes, and the um, nucleophile can therefore attack either the top lobe or the bottom lobe. And so in this case, 
the O bonds to the top. If we look at that middle series, the O is going to bond to the same orbital that the bromine was in. So we make that new bond um, on top. And then after our nucleophile becomes deprotonated in that second step, then we get our final product, which has an O, a CO bond on the top, which has the same configuration as the CBR bond that we started on. The leaving group is on the top. My new bond is on the top. So we call that retention of configuration. Um, and in the bottom series, the bromine was on the top and it left and the nucleophile attacks the bottom. And so then in the next step, we deprotonate our nucleophile. It loses that proton. And then in the final product, we have our nucleophile on the bottom. That CO bond is on the bottom of the molecule instead of on the top of the molecule. So we call that inversion of configuration. So notice here that it's not exactly 50-50 in this particular example. We get 40% retention and 60% inversion. That's generally true. We say that although in an SN1 we get both, we get retention and inversion, we still get more inversion than we do retention. And it's kind of a subtle difference, but notice how in that first, in the, both the middle reaction and the reaction on the bottom, in both of those series, notice how that Br- minus is still on top of the molecule. It was on top originally, that's where it was bonded, and when it's left, it hasn't gone very far. It's still kind of sitting on top of the molecule there. So because it's still on top, it's harder for the nucleophile to attack the top because the bromine is still hanging out. It's not completely gone. It's not like it disappears out of existence. It's still pretty much there on top because it just left an instant ago. So that's what that the text in green is indicating. Front side attack is slightly hindered by leaving group. That means it's harder for the nucleophile to attack the side that the leaving group was on. It's still possible and it still happens. In fact, it happens 40% of the time but it doesn't happen as much as the nucleophile attacking the bottom. It's easier for the nucleophile to attack the bottom because there's no bromine there. There's no leaving group that's blocking that face. So we get 40% retention, 60% inversion. We get more inversion than retention. So remember when we talk about stereochemistry, um, we have an R enantiomer and an S enantiomer. And when I start with a molecule that is not chiral, and we form a molecule, our product is chiral, we always form the two enantiomers in equal amounts. We call that racemization, which means I go from something that is not chiral, and then I form a chiral product, and I get 50% S and 50% R. I get a racemate. So racemizing, racemization, just means scrambling the stereochemistry. That means if I start with 100% R, I'm not going to get 100% S in this mechanism. I'm going to get some S and some R, generally pretty close to 50-50. So we, we racemize the stereocenter. It means we scramble it. It goes from, an, it goes from a pure 100% R or pure 100% S, and it gets mixed up, and some of it's R in the product, and some of it's S in the product. Um, so a racemate is one that has exactly 50% R and 50% S, and that's not exact. That's not what's happening here because we don't get exactly 50/50, but it does get scrambled, and we get some R and some S, but we still get more inversion than retention when we have an SN1 mechanism. Okay, so the final thing that we're going to talk about now in this section is carbocation rearrangements. And this is kind of a tricky subject. So notice that what's happening here in this mechanism. We generally assume that the nucleophile is going to be attached to the same carbon that the leaving group was on. That's what we've seen in every example we've looked at so far, whether it's on the same side as of the leaving group or it's on the opposite side as the leaving group, as in an SN2, the new bond is still on the same carbon that the leaving group was on. 
So in this example, notice how the bromine is on um, carbon uh, two in this case, if we count from the left, it goes one, two, three, four in that butane branch. So the carbon is on, the bromine is on carbon two, the green bromine. And then in our first product, my nucleophile, my new bond is on carbon two, just like we would expect. However, in the other product, the nucleophile is on carbon three. So somehow the nucleophile attached to both carbon two and carbon three which should seem unexpected to you because the whole way that it attaches is by replacing the leaving group. The nucleophile is supposed to replace the leaving group. So it totally makes sense that it would be on carbon two. It doesn't make much sense that it's on carbon three. How did it get there? How did the, how did the nucleophile attack a carbon that didn't even have a leaving group? Well, this only happens in SN1. This is called a rearrangement. This cannot happen in an SN2 mechanism. If this were an SN2, the bromine is on carbon two in the reactant, the nucleophile is on carbon two in the product, always. It always just replaces the leaving group. It cannot rearrange. But in SN1, it's possible that the nucleophile is, is going to be both where the leaving group was, on carbon two in this case, and also on an adjacent carbon either on the left or the right, it can switch. It can't go to any carbon that it wants to in the molecule. It's not like that nucleophile could be located in this case on carbon four, uh, but it can go to one that's right next door. So if the carbon, if the leaving group's on carbon two, it's possible that that, that nucleophile, the new bond, could show up on either carbon one or two or three. It could be on any of them. That are, that are right next to where the leaving group was, just directly adjacent, one carbon away. So let's see how that happens.
So here is um, an example of that happening. Uh, we see some stereochemistry. We see some wedges and dashes to make this more three-dimensional. So it's still, this is the same molecule we were just looking at. And what happens is the bromine has already left. That has left us with a uh, positive carbocation that is now planar, trigonal planar, so it's flat. It has a, a lobe open on the top. It has a lobe open on the bottom. So if there is a way that we can somehow change the position of that plus charge to an atom that's connected to more carbons it, from a secondary to a tertiary carbon, then it will become more stable. So in this case, because that group on the right has two is connected to two methyl groups and the carbon on the left is only connected to one methyl group, that's gonna make this carbocation more stable when it's on the right side instead of on the left side. So we can't just draw the plus side sign moving. That's not how this mechanism works. The plus sign does not just go from the left to the right. If I draw the arrow, because that's often what students want to do. They go, oh, the plus sign moves from the left carbon to the right carbon, so I draw an arrow and show the plus sign moving. The plus sign does move, but only because it's the H that's actually changing positions. The H changes positions, and when that happens, it satisfies the octet of the left carbon, but it, it breaks the octet of the right carbon because now the carbon that just lost the H, now it only has six electrons, so it becomes positive. So it's important to draw the arrows correctly when we're indicating a carbocation rearrangement like this. The other thing to note is there's only two kinds of carbocations that we're going to see, secondary and tertiary. Those are the only two kind of carbocations that are stable enough to exist. Methyl doesn't exist, primary doesn't exist, only secondary and tertiary. If you have a tertiary carbocation already, it's not going to rearrange. A tertiary carbocation cannot become any more stable than being tertiary. So the only kinds of carbocations that are going to have this move that we see here are secondary. And further, a secondary carbocation is only going to rearrange if it can become tertiary. If there's only primary or secondary carbons next to a secondary carbocation, a rearrangement's not going to occur because there's no way that it can become more stable. A secondary carbocation will only rearrange if there's a tertiary or quaternary carbocation next door. Now, notice I said quaternary for the first time now, and we'll see what happens then. But you can imagine that if I have, if that H that's moving, if that H was another CH3 group, what if I had three methyl groups there? If I had three methyl groups there, then I could still make a tertiary carbocation, but it wouldn't be an H that was changing positions. It would be a CH3 that was changing positions. And so that can happen too. This is called, a, what we're seeing here on this slide is called a hydride shift because the hydrogen moves but we can also have what's called a methyl shift if there's a methyl group on that carbon next door instead of an H. Now, but again, it's only going to happen if the carbon right next door is tertiary or quaternary. So let's look at the, the whole, the whole uh, mechanism here now. So we've got um, the, the carbocation has shifted positions, and so now that... Uh, nucleophile is going to attack the new carbocation, the tertiary carbocation, and after we deprotonate, we're going to end up with uh, our rearranged product. So remember that the leaving group was initially on carbon 2, and then after it left, we formed a carbocation on carbon 2, but then it rearranged, and so then the plus charge is now on carbon 3. So the nucleophile is going to attack the new carbocation, the rearranged carbocation, and that's going to put my new bond on carbon three. So this is how we get that rearranged product that we saw in the first slide there. It attacks both the second carbon and when there's a carbocation there, and then after the carbocation rearranges, it attacks the third carbon because the carbocation has moved in essence.
And what happens next is that the reaction carries on as we would expect for a normal SN1. The nucleophile is going to attack the carbocation. If my nucleophile, after it attacks, has a positive charge, the last step is that it becomes deprotonated. So in this case, my nucleophile is neutral. So after it attacks that carbocation, it's going to have a formal charge of plus because the, the oxygen only wants two bonds. And after it forms a new bond with the carbon, now it has three bonds. So now the O has a plus charge. I can't leave my final product with a plus charge. So what happens is some molecule, the solvent, or another molecule of nucleophile, as we see here, is going to take that H away and leave the electrons on the oxygen so that my final product is neutral and the oxygen only has two bonds and we get that rearranged product there.